Hello, I am Laurel Brennan, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here today with Peggy O'Mara. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you, Laurel. It's lovely to be here. So Peggy didn't know that um, I was her biggest fan, maybe, until I found her on LinkedIn a little while ago and we started a conversation. So we are eventually going to get into what Peggy is doing nowadays, but I have to start with um, the way Peggy influenced myself and my husband and our entire family, and that was through Mothering Magazine. Mm. So I'm going to read um, a little bit about Peggy, her bio, and then, then I'm going to share all the positive impacts she had on our life that she doesn't know about. Yeah. <clears throat> so Peggy O'Mara was the editor and publisher of Mother, Mothering Magazine for 31 years. Currently, can, you can find her articles on Medium. The author of Having a Baby Naturally, Natural Family Living, and A Quiet Place. Peggy has conducted workshops at Omega Institute, Esalen. I don't know if I said that right. I just learned what that was today and okay. looks amazing. La Leche League and Bioneers. She serves on the advisory boards of Attachment Parenting International and Holistic Moms Network. Peggy is the mother of four and the grandmother of three. She is currently working with the Care Income Now campaign of the Global Women's Strike and the ABC Coalition of the Children's Defense Fund to advocate for a universal, excuse me, universal child allowance in the US. Her previous and current work is directly influential on brain health, in my opinion. I don't know if that was your intention, but um, that is my area of interest now, and I look at all the things that I learned from you and the, the, the authors that you supported, the articles that you published in Mothering Magazine, and probably 99% of it <laughs> directly ties to brain health. Um, so actions can be taken to support brain health before birth, and that was something even discussed in the magazine, you know, how you can have a healthy pregnancy um, and how that health influences that child. The, the, the pregnancy of the mother influences that child throughout a lifetime. So Peggy have, has been a, an advocate in promoting physical, social, emotional and environmental health through direct and indirect ways with her writing and profess, professional engagements, especially for the most vulnerable. So, Peggy, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. That's lovely. And I'm also doing, I've been also, because I'm an older person myself, been looking into aging and some of our um, biases about aging. And um, so we can also speak about that um, as well, because I think that ties also even more directly or more specifically into your work. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I will make sure that that's noted. <clears throat> So I have to share with you how I was introduced to Mothering Magazine, if that's okay. I'd love it. I took a Bradley Method childbirthing class and toward the end, so that's a, you know, how to prepare for a natural childbirth. And I went down that road only because my sister, who's older than me, had kids first and had a typical hospital birth that was rather traumatic and not at all what she wanted it to be. Um, and I said, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through the trauma that she went through. Um, what else can I do instead? And found out about the Bradley method. So at the end of that class, they were giving out, um, you know, little, little pieces of paper about Mothering Magazine. And I kind of put it aside and thought, well, how is that different than all the other parenting magazines that are out there? And I asked in, in one of the... Um, one of the last classes, you know, what's so different about this magazine or like um, everything. So we're going to, we'll give you a copy. And so I still had this kind of, you know, in, in the back of my mind um, when I was trying to mother my, you know, three month old. And I was desperately trying to find the, the answers to the breastfeeding problems and the crying problems. And I couldn't, you know, I was on my own most of the time. My husband was at work and I didn't have a, a mothering community yet. Yeah. And um, I read in one of these other mainstream magazines, two different opposing views in the same magazine about how to help a crying baby. It was like, you know, put them in the crib, close the door. <laughs> 
walk away, let them cry. And the other one was like, well, check on them, you know, every five minutes and soothe them from across the room. And, and then the other one was like, it just, it, nothing set right with me. And I was so frustrated with their conflicting information that I threw that magazine in the trash can. And I went back to mothering, or I, I think that's when I got a subscription. And I was like, oh, I found my community. <laughs> you know, I didn't have these people next to me in my world. Yeah, many of us, yeah. I read this magazine cover to cover. And the information in there was referenced and gave you actionable information. Um, it changed the way my husband engaged with our children. We got, we now have three. Um, there are big gaps of 23 and almost 20 and 11. Um, cool. You know, my, my husband wore a sling <laughs> and was very proud of his sling. And, um, you know, we decided to, to co-sleep because that's what we were naturally doing, but we were afraid to tell people we were doing that because it was a bad thing and you shouldn't do that. But this magazine taught us how to do it safely. What are the benefits? And my life changed. I got more sleep. <laughs> I was a happier mother. The baby was happier. And it, it just, that was just the very beginning. I mean, then there was articles on how to reduce toxins in your environment, how to support the gardening program at your kid's school, you know, it just, it went on and on. Um, and I'm just grateful. My husband want, wants me to pass along his gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, the love and the energy and obviously the hard work that went into creating that space um and running that magazine for 31 years 31 years well thank you laurel that means so much to me because it was also my journey you know i was sharing what i was learning and was that same lonely mother in the middle of the night wondering how will i get through this what can i do um and so i really that's where i was coming from i really wanted to share that information so other mothers and fathers didn't suffer um you know, and we all suffer with our with our new ones, especially our first. But so thank you. I'm so glad that that spoke to you. Yeah, I was thinking as we we're preparing for this talk that beyond my own mother, you were the most influential person in my mothering. So thank you. Thank you. You know, thank I don't, you. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'm crying too. I'm crying over here. I mean, I had the Dr. Sears book and he was fantastic too. He was super helpful. And I had some great La Leche League leaders. Um, but there was something about that mother and community. It really like, was. Like you said, where you felt, oh, I'm not alone. I, I'm not crazy to be doing these things that I instinctively feel are right. Other people are doing those. That it was that community, that letter section that we have, other mothers um, encouraging each other. There was nothing like that, really. No. At the time, and there was no internet when I first started. I mean, in the early days. So it's hard for people to imagine now when they can so easily find information. And But the truth is they can't always find different points of view on the internet. But even so, you can find information easier. But it's hard to imagine how it was when we were waiting for that magazine to come in the mail. I mean, literally waiting, reading it on the yes. way to the, in your house from the mailbox, you know? Absolutely, you're so right. Yeah. Yes, and you did feel connected to a community yeah. despite not being able to, you know, send each other messages on yeah. <laughs> on the internet, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so you mentioned you, you were, you started the magazine or it, it was around a couple of years before you took it over. Correct. Right. Um, but what what was your journey that kind of brought you to to Mothering Magazine and then beyond where you are today? Well, I started out as a, you know, I lived in southern New Mexico, was very rural. Um, I was a back to the lander, a hippie. Um, I, so I always was in, I already was inclined toward a natural lifestyle. Um, but there weren't a lot of resources there. So I saw a sign for La Leche League. I went to La Leche League meeting and it really spoke to me in terms of its philosophy, um, its values, 
And I just love that. So, so much that I've done, and I think the Mother in Magazine as well came from that foundation. Uh, I got, got really involved in La Leche League. There were only like 11 leaders in the whole state at that time. I did the newsletter, I certified new leaders. And then I had, when I had my first, and I got in La, into La Leche League while I was pregnant, but when I had my first daughter, um, I was ecstatic. I was so happy and literally ecstatic. And I didn't, no one had told me that. I just heard about the bad things. And I, so I wrote an article called In Defense of Motherhood because at that time, and this was in the 1970s, uh, feminism was strong and it was doing a lot of good things, but part of what it was doing is being really critical of mother in the home and calling that um, the family servant or some kind of oppression. And I learned early on that it wasn't so much my child that oppressed me, it was really the society and the lack of support that I had. Um, so I sent that article to Red Book Magazine. They had a new mother's competition or story, got rejected. I sent it to New Age, it got rejected. And about that time, I went up to um, Albuquerque, because I was, as I said, in New Mexico, and saw Mothering Magazine at a co-op. And I picked it up and I said, oh, I wish I had started that. <laughs> um, so I sent my article then to Mothering and it was accepted, a poem was accepted. I then moved up to Albuquerque, got involved with the magazine, although I had three kids under five, so I pretty much could do nothing um, but that. <laughs> but eventually the uh, gal that founded it, Addie Evanson, wanted to sell it. And I was able, my husband and I were able to just to take it over. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any down payment. I had this conversation with her dad, convinced him that we could somehow do it. And we just made payments out of the magazine to pay it off. It wasn't too much, but it was, it was enough. And, um, and then just grew it. And I learned as I went along, because I was afraid, I knew I knew nothing. And Addie, the gal who had founded it, had left these folio magazines about magazine publishing. I couldn't even look at them. I didn't want to know what I didn't know because it, I was so aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, she gave me a big bag and literally a paper bag of mail that hadn't been answered. So I would take the letter out one at a time, <laughs> type them in my blue selectric typewriter, which I adored. Um, and just one step at a time, you know, I, the first cover that I did, I love the cover purple. So I put purple type and it was on a black and white photo and you couldn't even read anything. Um, the first photos I ever did, I would take, I would uh, paste them down, even though this was going to be uh, typeset by somebody else you weren't supposed to do. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I learned from my mistakes and I learned from, and I was enthusiastic and I wanted primarily to share information. I'd already always been somebody who had a file cabinet worth full of articles. Oh, this, well, Stephanie might like this, or, oh, this would help her. Mm -hmm. um, I was always a researcher and a gatherer of information for my own self, really. I think I did it to uh, support myself and my own intuition as much as anything, and then shared, you know, things with others. So I was able to take that, the magazine over in 1980, and, and I had this idea. I thought, you know, if I just put the high heels and lipstick on the, these ideas, people will think, people will accept them. You know, if they look like other things, like what they're used to in the culture, they will accept them. And so over time that became true where, you know, I think it, the magazine looked really beautiful. It was designed really beautifully. Um, and that took us a while to get there, but yeah. And then it was also, you know, I think a time, a perfect time in the culture. We didn't have the internet. Um, people were hungry for ideas about raising their child it, in a way that was intuitive to them, as you're saying. They, they, these, uh, we have a, I mean, I think we have, and I'm always, I get sick of just criticizing the culture, but we do have a culture that's not very child friendly and that is a kind of counter to the natural needs of the human, of the human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to comment on your mentioning of photos and when you taped them down. And I also wanted to share something that was impactful for our family. So I, I'm a white lady. My husband's a black man. And there was not a lot of diversity in the culture, in magazines or advertisements like it is today. Like today you go in, you know, any Target and there's 
biracial pictures of people everywhere and lots of diversity. That was not the case when my kids were little. And, and I loved to open the magazine and see a diverse display of people in there. So thank you for being conscious about that. Well, that was such a huge issue for me and for us. And you know what was, is that such the tragedy of that is that in those early days, if we had a black mom on our cover, it would not sell as well because people thought it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. right? Because of that social segregation that we still have in society and had even more so then. So I was really determined to do that. And even when we did that, and then our advertisers would finally come along with that, you know, because if we would do that in the editorial and the advertisers had a bunch of white people in their ads, you know, it wouldn't have the same effect. So I think that we did help to change the culture, but it really is about having, you know, living in that culture, not just portraying it, but living in that culture yeah. of diversity that, that is so rich in our country and so beautiful. And, um, yeah, so thank so, you. But thank you for being an early one to, to address so diversity. Yeah, it was obviously intentional and it came through, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I think I, I covered my basic love of the magazine. I won't go into like very specific details of all the things. Um, the one thing I, I would love for you to touch on um, and a little bit more of a, of a broad sense is attachment parenting. Like, what is that? Um, what does that mean? Why is it good for the baby, for the mom, for the dad, for those involved? Um, and this is, this is where I think the benefits to brain health begin. I do too. Um, so for those of you, for those out there listening who are not familiar with attachment parenting, you are in, involved in the advisory board of Attachment Parenting International. This is obviously something you're passionate about. So from your perspective, what is attachment parenting? I have something actually I pulled up that I had um, written because so, I'd like to really speak about this in a in a a way that's uh, clear for people. Can you still see me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so there is really in psychology there is a formal theory called attachment theory, and it's based on the premise that adult social behavior is related to early experience in significant ways. And it started with a man named John Bowlby, who in 1951 wrote a report for the World Health Organization that was the first time that there had been any standard set for infant and child care. So this is 1951, how kind of new that is. And what he wrote is that the infant and young child should experience a warm, intimate, and continuous relationship with his mother or permanent mother substitute in which both find satisfaction and enjoyment. So what you know, other researchers went on to um, look at, in particular, the first three years of life. And that's a critical period during which the foundation is set for attachment to ourselves and to others. And what we secure during that attachment period, the qualities that we get from that attachment period are trust, empathy, dependency, affection, conscience, and optimism. Mm -hmm many qualities that we see lacking in people in adult society today. Yeah. Um, there was a man named Eric Erickson who identified the first year of life is the time when we learn to have faith in others and the environment. If we get kind care, we trust the environment. If we get cold and different care, we mistrust the environment. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, and she found out in her studies when she looked at tribes that those that withheld uh, touch and infancy were the most violent. Uh, there was a medical researcher named Mary Ainsworth who observed that indulging the early dependency needs of children results in independence and self-reliance. And we're afraid if we do that, we're afraid that we have to impose independence on children, but in fact, they grow into that in their own time when we allow them to be dependent. And it is the sensitive responsiveness of the mother that enables the child to explore the environment. And then there's a neurologist named Richard Restack who said that physical holding and caring of the infant turns out to be the most important factor responsible for the infant's normal mental and social development. So all these things touch on breastfeeding, co-sleeping, baby wearing, 
all of which foster secure att att attachment because they respond to the baby's need to be touched and held. I mean, that's what babies need, the whole baby carrier thing. Babies are so happy when they're being carried around. Yeah. But I'd like to say that these are not the practices of attachment parenting and that it's not really a practice. It's not a dogma. It's a philosophy. There are no rules to it. It's simply about acknowledging the legitimate needs of the human baby and trying to meet them as best we can. So while they, the roots of attachment parenting are an ancient tribal society and they're verified by modern science, it has no script. It's about being responsive to the baby and trusting the baby, letting the baby lead. Because for me, that's how I learned to be a mother through breastfeeding, through following the baby's lead. Um, so it's not a contest. It's not about being uh, better than someone else. It doesn't have rules. And I, and your work, I think it really speaks to your work because and I'm sure you've heard of uh, James McKenna, who's a researcher at Notre Dame who has a sleep lab. And he's he has moms and babies come in there and hook them up to electrodes and finds out what's happening when they're sleeping together. And he finds that in fact, it's the mother's respiratory system that regulates the baby's respiratory system. Mm -hmm. So I think that attachment parenting regulates the baby, responds to the baby's need to be regulated and therefore creates a healthier individual. Um, because we know that, and I think you know this from th your work, that the ability to self-regulate is related to cognitive function. Right. Um, when we're disorganized, when we're in social chaos, we literally can't think straight. Right, right. Yeah, thank you for, for giving clarity to what attachment parenting is and what attachment parenting is not. Yeah, because I think a lot of people think yeah. it's dogma or rules or I have to do this or that. And it's just really responding to your baby. Your baby will teach you how to do whatever your right. baby needs. And the story that I was sharing earlier on about you know, having a mainstream magazine that was telling me do this, no, do that, no, do this, no, do that. That um, made me distrust my own instinct. Yes. And that's where the Absolutely. problem comes. Absolutely. You um, think that, that someone else out there is the expert. Yeah. Your baby, who no one else knows but you. Right. So it, the, the baby will lead you if you allow yourself to listen to the baby without the external noises. And, and you will learn that because you don't you can't turn those off in the beginning you get better at it so to give yourself time to get better at that time to trust yourself because don't, didn't you find that with more experience certainly with your third i mean you're like okay i know how this is going to go but even with your first the more experience you have in trusting yourself where that works out the more you can trust yourself so i think it's okay to also accept that you're going to you're going to be confused. You're going to be confused about those social voices, especially if they're close to you, especially if they're family members, um, especially with family members, right? right. You, you don't want to tell them the crazy things you're doing, even though my mother would somehow always figure them out, even though I'd never tell her. <laughs> she said, I bet you're going to do that homeschooling thing. I said, oh, yeah, how'd you even hear about that? <laughs> and literally 20 years later, we're in Walmart together, and she says, there's a young mom, and she said, you know, you should do that homeschooling. <laughs> So, yeah, so I think you have to learn to trust yourself as well. But, um. Yeah, yeah. Another personal story about the trusting your own instincts. So my dad's mom, um, you know, was a very intelligent woman who was reading books and Dr. Spock was, you know, the, the mainstream book at that time. And so she raised her boys the way she thought she was supposed to raise her boys. You know, fast forward a couple decades and my dad's um getting his PhD in clinical psychology and has to do his therapy, you know, to be the patient. And he realizes that, you know, all the stuff that his mom withheld from him is, was really painful. You know, how she didn't hug him, play with him, cuddle him, and had a conversation with her about that at that time. And she said, you know, it was, a, it was against my own instinct. Oh. I wanted to go do to get on the floor and play with you but it said in the book not to so i would just stay at the door so you couldn't see me and and watch you play oh yeah and when i for a gerontology class in college i interviewed her and a couple of the, you know, one of the questions was like what's your biggest regret and she said my biggest regret is not following my own instinct and oh. not coddling and picking up my kids you know wow I know. Yeah. That's, I, hard, that's a lot of, 
I really appreciate that she could acknowledge and share that. Yeah. That's hard for people to do that. But she was, you know, a force for good in the world. So she, she made up for it. And she's someone that I, you know, I call upon when I'm thinking about fierce, powerful, loving women. So she yeah. was one of those. It also speaks to our resilience that even when things aren't perfect, when we're, if we're not parented or mothered the way that we wished, we can kind of, I felt, didn't you find that, I felt that every stage of my children's lives that I remothered myself, that as they went through a stage, because of seeing how it was and how it really was supposed to be, that I was healed by that as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So let's make a little pivot into what you're doing today. So you you write for Medium. Um, I read your article this morning on uh, um, Universal. No, the tell me the art and the name of the article. I should have it in front. There's, I mean, is it Universal Basic Income? Universal Basic Basic Income. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. So I I'd had no idea that there are a lot of communities piloting this. Yeah. Um, so that was fascinating. Thank you for writing that article. Um, so talk about what you're doing nowadays and the the communities that you're involved with? Uh, well, the medium art medium came from, I started my own website after mothering um, and I just wasn't doing as much writing. I was maintaining my website and trying to finance it and do all these things. So I just decided to go to medium a couple of years ago and, and I just can write there and, and possibly even make a little money sometime, you know, because if people sign up for emails, you get, you get more followers, you get more money. Um, but primarily just because I love to, cover these issues. There's so many important issues. Um, and one of the things that I saw with young parents and I used to write about is how different the United States is as a high income country from other countries. So all other high income countries offer a number of benefits to families. Uh, they offer a pregnancy benefit sometimes, a benefit, a child benefit, a benefit if you're caring for your own child, uh, we have none of those things in the United States and people, moms, young moms feel depressed for reasons that I think are their fault when they're really lack of community and lack of social supports that they have. So I became, I don't even know, this group kind of found me um, that does the care income now. And they're an international group started by a woman named Selma James. Um, she started this wages for housework campaign in the seventies just really to point out the fact that women were doing valuable work in the home that wasn't compensated, that needed to be acknowledged. And that continues to be the case today. Unpaid work done by women and girls is in the trillions of dollars uh, globally. So the group that I'm involved with Care Income Now has, was advocating for the child tax credit that we had as part of the American Rescue Plan, advocated, started advocating for it during the uh, presidential campaign and then throughout the beginning of uh, President Biden's uh, tenure. Uh, so there was then passed a child tax credit. Did you get it in your family? I as, think as so. I think so, yes. <laughs> so for my daughter, who's a single mom, it was really uh, made a huge difference for her. So people were getting uh, $250 to $300 a month, depending on how old their child was. But that stopped after a certain period of time and people are still trying to get it back going um, again as a child benefit comparable to what a lot of other countries have. The ABC coalition of the Children's Defense Fund, which I found out about through the Care Income Now campaign is advocating for a kind of a universal basic income for children. We have a lot of children in poverty, millions of children in poverty in the United States and the child tax credit uh, eliminated, reduced that poverty, I think 40 to 50%. Wow. And what poverty means is that people aren't eating. And if you, I mean, when I'm hungry, I can't sleep at night. I'll wake up in the night to eat if I'm hungry. So it, you know, it, it makes, it makes me really sad to think that people are hungry out there and I want to help them in some way. And so this is one way the thinking about two things, both an income for the caregiver and a benefit for the child. The child shouldn't have to be eating or not based on the resources of their parent. And parents are in poverty for all kinds of reasons that aren't their own faults. Um, so those are the two things that I've been working on currently that I'm excited about. I'm still 
always writing about breastfeeding and childbirth. And, and then I've gotten involved because I'm an older person myself into, and I'm not like, I'm not working for this. I'm just learning about this group called Changing the Narrative in Colorado, uh, where I live. And it's really about ageism, that ageism is the number one bias in the world identified by the World Health Organization, even more than racism. Mm -hmm. if, you look, if you start to look at the way older people are depicted, and I'm sure you have, in the media, their withered hands, you know, they're in wheelchairs half the time, they always have cognitive decline, even though, you know, everyone doesn't have that as they get older, and some people even have it when they're older. Uh, and so I started reading this book called Breaking the Age Code by Becca Levy. You're, you haven't heard of this book? No. I will put it in my, I will put a picture of it right now. Um, so she's done all this research and the subtitle is how your beliefs about aging determine how long and well you live. Let me read you this one part. So what she said, what my team found was that people with negative age beliefs were much more likely to develop the telltale plaques and tangles than those with positive age beliefs. In fact, their hippocampi, the part of the brain responsible for memory, shrank three times as fast. So her research has found that you can add seven years to your life by positive age beliefs. It doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, the changes in aging, but that by positive age beliefs, you can literally live longer. Wow. And I find myself noticing that as an older person where I just ascribe everything to getting older. Oh, that's because you're old. Oh, that's some limitation that you have. And it's very similar to, to the new mothering thing, right? To being a new mother and thinking that everything is because your child is what? X, Y, Z or whatever. It's not just part of the territory. So check out that book. I think it will, you'll really like that. Yeah, thank and you. So I want to work on uh, writing. I want to write about that and get more involved in that in terms of sharing the, that with people and sharing how um, having more positive beliefs uh, can help us and can help our society. Again, if you look at how older people are portrayed in the media, as I mentioned before, it's really very negative. And, you know, she says in here also, she mentions that in other countries, she says that um, dementia is five times more common in the United States than it is in India. And so she thinks that a lot of this is the age, you know, the positive age beliefs. And a lot of uh, societies that have positive age beliefs also have more intergenerational living. And that in the United States, our uh, age belief or our beliefs about aging have gotten more negative as we have moved away from intergenerational living, where we're around older people. We, you know, we have these stereotypes about them or we're more isolated. So um, I'm excited to share that information with people as well. And, to, and as I did with mothering, it's when I'm learning something, I love to write about it. It helps me to figure it out, you know, to research yeah. it and, and write about it. And it's not like I've got it all figured out, but, but that's one of the ways that I do figure it out, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. I live with my 83-year-old dad. Okay, and, cool. Um, <clears throat> I was interviewing him. Um, he was one of my first interviews. And once I started, you know, really digging deeper into brain health, I looked at him like he is doing all the things that they say that you should do. <laughs> he walks to the grocery store and carries his groceries home. He meditates, he goes to bed early, he eats early. Um, like all, he has relationships, strong relationships that he nourishes, like why he's doing all the things. I have a good example and you know, that I get to see every day, I'm lucky. Why is eating early important? Mm. So I was trained at the Apollo Health under Dr. Dale Bredesen. And he um, uses to help you remember the keto flex 12, three, so 12 slash three. So it's getting into ketosis. Um, this is a healthy ketosis. Some ketosis will, will talk about lots of meat and lots of butter and dairy. This is a 70% vegetable um, and healthy fats, avocados and nuts and seeds and olive oil. Um, the 12, three, is 12 hours at a minimum of intermittent fasting. 
So time that you're not eating at all. And then the three is three hours before bed, not to eat. So when you, um, when your body is digesting, um, it, it's not using its immune function to go around and make repairs. So you want to go into sleep without having to digest your food. And does doing that, because I find that I eat later because of blood sugar. So, but doing, eating this other way improves your blood sugar. So yeah. that's not necessary. Is that correct? So that was something that I discovered after visiting a nutritionist. Um, I got an MS diagnosis. I saw that on your website. Yeah. Okay. And um, just was really fortunate to have a conversation with my neighbor who introduced me to a functional nutritionist. And um, she said, you know, how, asked how I feel during the day and, you know, how I respond to hunger. I'm like, I can be fine. And then I'm starving. And then I like have to eat immediately. And she's like, right um, and I used to only eat fruit in the morning. Um, she said, well, how does that make you feel? I'm like, well, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I have these other episodes, you know, where I'm starving and I guess I'm not really energetic. And she said, okay, you need to have fat and protein every time you put food in your mouth. And that information, um, you know, all those years ago has changed the way I feel day in and day out. I don't get that crash where I'm starving. Oh my gosh, I have to eat. I don't wake up in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. I have to eat, but I used to mm -hmm. eat cookies right before bed. That was my routine for decades. Yeah. Cookies and milk. Well, sugar is not going to help. Yeah, me too. I'll have that. I'll still do that sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to learn from you as well. And at functional medicine, I uh, had a doctor who was training in that. Uh, and helped me uh, resolve some eczema that I'd had for years and diagnosed it as something else entirely as yeast, which is totally in it. Anyway, so I'm interested right. in knowing more yeah. about what you're working on as well. Well, I'm, I'm happy to share what I know. You, you continue to teach me. Um, even just today when I was reading your, your bio and it said that you had done workshops at the Omega Institute and Esalen and Bioneers, and I hadn't heard of any of those. I looked all of them. I looked all them up, and I said, "Oh, <laughs> I, I need to be involved with all of these." I sent them immediately to my twenty-three-year-old son. Like, this might be something you might be interested in. And I think they would like your work as well, Laurel. I think they would be all be interested in your work, especially Esalen and Omega, maybe Bioneers as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, so you're you're still you're still teaching. So oh, so glad. It's good we share for each other. That's how we learn. I know. I want to learn from you because I feel like I'm healthy. I have positive attitudes. I have lots of energy, um, but I could work on my diet a little bit more. Yeah. 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 That 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 little window of not eating before bed, um, I think, is very impactful and easy to slowly add time to. So I I talk a lot about you know creating a just right challenge. So maybe for most people immediately stopping eating at seven o'clock when they normally go to bed at 10 that 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 seems like too much but i usually have a i usually have a nine o'clock snack okay well the next week have a have an eight o'clock snack instead or eight thirty snack and then slowly back it up um that kind of thing and and having the fat and and protein so having a good dinner i mean what about like an ayurvedic medicine they'll say to eat lighter as the day goes on anything about that i mean if you're going to have that three hour window, are you going to have a nice dinner then? And that um, kind of depends on person to person. So some people like to have their, their biggest meal in the middle of the day um, and skip breakfast. And that gives them that um, window of intermittent fasting. And depending on genetics, um, sometimes we recommend extending that 12 hours to maybe, excuse me, 15 or 16 hours. So um, it really individualized and personalized medicine yeah because yeah, i like a big breakfast i do like to have a big breakfast but yeah well all right cool yeah well <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to to connect i'm so right. excited that Good. we found each other me too. Me too. um is there anything oh, else well, there was that other one thing i wanted to mention so as part of the work that i'm doing we have created a survey called what mothers and others care and what mothers and other caregivers want because okay. nobody as, ever asks us what we want. They make all these policies. Like right now, there's the big push or has been one of the big, you know, there's the child tax credit, but there's also been a push for childcare 
but most families of young kids don't use institutional childcare. They either, you know, like watch their kids themselves, about 25% of parents or have family members. Um, so this survey is just, it really talks about, ask a lot of questions about how you spend your time, how much time you spend caregiving, um, and how you feel valued or not valued by society, and whether you think um, a care income for caregiving of children and disabled and elders is um, a good idea. So I'd love to let uh, your audience know about those surveys. I don't know, you know, they're links, they're links. So maybe I could send you the links and you'd post them when you post the- Absolutely. Or something because yep. um, we'd like more people to fill it out and just get more opinions, you know, yeah. from people. Absolutely. And I actually publicize the survey uh, as a, hopefully to help public policy. Absolutely. Yep. We can put it in the, um, in the show notes and we can definitely provide this, this link. So say the name of the survey again, what mothers and others want. Others, yeah. What mothers and other caregivers want. Okay. And kind of a, a side note that came up in my mind as you were sharing, um, what's common in the United States and, and what's common in other wealthy countries. And um, I had the great fortune of living at Stirling University in Scotland for two years while my husband was working on a PhD. Yeah. And I happened to be there al along with 20 other international women who were also there because their husbands were getting a PhD. And we had um, weekly meetings and we regularly went to each other's homes and they would create, you know, food from traditional food from their country and we'd share um, child care and clean up and it was you know some of the most impactful time of my life i bet how, um, old, how old was your child or where were your kids so my family? kids when we moved there my daughter was 10 months old and my son was um almost four they okay. just turned four so so they went to um primary and preschool in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And um, what I learned is what all the other, all these other countries have that we don't. And I think oh, no. it's, it yeah. was unbelievable. There, there was um, another a woman from, from Poland, her husband was doing his PhD on looking at all of the maternity um, support from in other countries. Oh. There, we get no support in the United States and so many countries around the world give partial or full income yeah, absolutely. for six months, a year, even two years. I had a friend from Uzbekistan. She got her, I think her full salary for a full year. For a full year. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just, it's mind blowing. And as a result, we have less people having children in the United States. You know, they just can't afford it. Um, and I think a really interesting thing for me is in breastfeeding, like one of the obstacles to breastfeeding is all the formula marketing, right? Especially in the United States. In the United States, we value work more than caregiving. And, and we do in the world, you know, we don't really articulate or compensate the value of caregiving. But our gross domestic product counts formula feeding, but not breastfeeding. And breastfeeding, if you counted it, which you, there are measured ways to count it, acceptable ways to count it, it would be billions of dollars in every country, even more so than for formula. So that's part of the way our economic markers are skewed. And then add to that the United States, really not, just not valuing maintaining. We value producing. You can go outside of the home and make something, but maintaining the home, which is necessary to go outside and produce something, is not valued, not articulated the value of. And right. we saw that in the pandemic, especially, didn't we? Where everything fell back on women in the home, taking care of the kids and school now on Zoom and, and all the other things. Um, so I, I, that's what I'm trying to articulate in my work and through these organizations is the value of caregiving. And you know, even the UN has put in, in um, suggested that caregiving be uh, counted in national accounts that countries use, whether it's GDP or whatever. Uh, so I think it's it's huge. It's not just wouldn't it be nice. It's it's 
it's a contribution that has huge amount of economic value and social value in the sense that as your friend that you're talking about, those women that you met in Scotland, I mean, you can actually take a breath. You can actually take care of your family when you have the right financial resources. Yeah. And you don't need to be rich. You just need to not be in chaos all the time. Right. You can't that take has... a off or a day off because you won't, you know, be able to make your bills. And it has short-term and long-term impact on health. It, absolutely. I mean, when you support mothers breastfeeding their kids, they have, they have fewer allergies, they have higher IQ, they have, you know, and just, just like you said, the, 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 cogn the cognitive benefits, yes, but also the, the emotional benefits. If you're not feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I have to go back to work and, in six weeks, how just yeah. the chaos, the stress yeah. of it. Yeah. And most of the time, you're not even get paid for those six weeks. Oh, no, you're not getting paid. You got to fight to have unpaid leave for goodness yeah, sake. Yeah, right. I don't even have that. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing now to support um, universal child allowance. I'm in, in full support of it. And I can't wait to learn more. Um, and I, look forward to sharing this survey, what mothers and other caregivers want. And Peggy, it's been an absolute pleasure being it's with you today. Pleasure. Let's figure out other ways we can stay in touch, work together. Absolutely. And really people can- about all these things, yeah. Absolutely. And people yeah. can find you on Medium. Is there anywhere else that you want people to find you? Yeah, so we'll start there. I think that's the place to find me the best. I mean, or easiest where, again, I have my writing. I do have an article, a recent article on breastfeeding at risk. and about maternal mortality, all kinds of things. And um, and oh, I'm also going to say that breastfeeding also has benefits for the mother, as much as for the child. Absolutely. It's well documented, less cancer, all kinds of things. So, um, and, and as you know, in your work, these are the things we need to be supporting. The, the society often tempts us with so many things that are bad for us, you know, yeah. it's funny for them, but not for our health, that we have to be really vigilant about that. And, yeah just of that so and i'd love to know more about your work so i hope we can stay in touch absolutely thank you peggy thank you so very much thank you thank you so much bye bye